Hello, welcome to the second week of the course Energy Demand in Buildings. The focus of the course is on the demand side of the energy chain. Always keep in mind where we are in the energy chain. At the end of the week, you will know how to estimate how much cooling or heating energy is needed depending on outdoor temperature, building characteristics and occupancy. But let's start a bit broader and look at all energy needs in a building. Take a few seconds to think about why energy is needed in a building. First, you want a nice comfortable temperature, so very often energy will be needed to either heat or cool the rooms. Then, you also need heat for hot tap water for showering or doing the dishes, and also some heat to cook. Maybe you also thought about cooling for food, like in a fridge. In this course, we will classify fridges into the big bunch of electrical appliances used for various purposes, like laptops, adapters, chargers, printers, washing machines, tumble dryers, dishwashers, Lighting, televisions, home theatres, vacuum cleaners, food processors, sometimes also pumps for water circulation, etc. In energy science, we make a difference between diverse forms of energy and it is really important to realize the difference between thermal energy and electrical energy. Roughly said, thermal energy is about heat and cold, while electrical energy is about powering appliances. It may be confusing, especially for those coming from warm countries with essentially a demand for space cooling. Space cooling is very often delivered with electrical air conditioning, by which it may not be clear that a cooling demand is a thermal demand. So, space heating and cooling, hot tap water and cooking belong to the demand for thermal energy, while appliances belong to the demand for electrical energy. Let's look first to which parts of the energy demand, sorry, let's look first which parts of the energy demand is sensitive to building characteristics. The only ones in the list of electrical appliances are lighting and pumps for water circulation, if any. The later one may depend on the building height, while the first one, lighting, is strongly dependent on building design. How large and high are the windows, how deep is the building, what type of glass is used. The demands for space heating and space cooling depend very much on how well the building is insulated, how airtight the building is, that is, how much outside air is coming in it. All these are building characteristics. And the demands for lighting, heating and cooling are also very dependent on the weather conditions. On the contrary, the energy demand for hot tap water, cooking and all appliances, except lighting and pumping, are not building dependent at all. And all these demands are very much related to the occupants of the buildings and people's behaviour. Let's focus now on space heating and cooling, which I remind you is responsible for around half of the total energy use in buildings. So, the question now is which are the thermal processes responsible for the energy demand for space heating and cooling, or in other words, which heat flows are responsible for the fact that we need to heat or cool a building. Because we want to determine how much heating and cooling we need, we do not consider any heating or cooling systems in the building. We just look at the construction and the people inside and based on that we want to estimate how much heating and cooling is needed to maintain nice indoor conditions in such a way that later we can buy and install the right heating and cooling equipment. Basically, we can say there are four main energy transfer processes responsible for heat flowing in and out a building. The first one consists of the energy flows through the building envelope. What we call the building envelope is in fact the construction, facade walls, floor, roof, windows. 
we call these flows transmission heat flows, and they arise simply because of temperature differences between indoor and outdoor. They have nothing to do with air flows. It is just being, it's just heat being transported from warm to cold. The second one is about the energy coming with air flows from outside. We call them ventilation and infiltration flows. The third one relates to the sun. When the sun shines, the building gains energy through solar radiation. The fourth and last one is about internal heat gains by people and appliances inside the building. As a short note, for the ones with a thermodynamic background, transmission flows are a mix of conduction through the construction materials and convection on both indoor and outdoor surfaces of a wall. Ventilation and infiltration are based on convection and advection heat transfer. Solar gains are about radiative heat transfer, and internal heat gains are a mix of radiative and convective heat transfer. We are going to make a balance of these four transfer processes in order to find out if the air in the building needs heat or cold to be at a nice temperature, and how much. We can make an energy balance because of the first law of thermodynamics, which is the law of conservation of energy. It states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be converted from one form to the other. In other words, it is conserved. So, for a system like the air in a building, in which we assume there are no heat-producing chemical reactions taking place, the first law states that all energy coming into the system, our building air therefore, is equal to all energy coming out of the system, plus the energy stored inside the system. Energy in equals energy stored plus energy out. In this course, we are going to make a simplification and consider that, during the time period studied, the energy stored in the building construction is negligible. The stored energy is, for instance, solar radiation that accumulates slowly in the walls and is also slowly released to the indoor air. We will just assume that there is no heat storage by the construction and that all energy that flows in also, in the end, flows out. So, energy coming in, E in, equals E out. We will see later in this course when this is a valid assumption. So, to determine the energy demand for space heating and cooling, we will make a balance of the four main energy transfer processes we described a few minutes ago. Transmission, ventilation and infiltration, solar gains and internal heat gains. To do so, we will have to estimate all of them and to determine if it is an energy input to the building and its indoor air, or if it is an energy output. In thermodynamics, we always use the convention that the energy input to a system is counted positive and the energy output is counted negative. Remind this convention because it is very important when making the balance. Let's take a few examples. Solar gains and internal heat gains, are they positive or negative? Well, as the name said, they are gains, so input to the building and its indoor air. Therefore, there will be positive. And what about transmission and ventilation and infiltration? Well, we already said they, were very, they are very dependent on the outdoor temperature. So, when it is very cold outside, the energy will flow out of the building. While when it is very hot outside, a lot of energy will come inside the building. So, transmission, ventilation and infiltration may be negative or positive. The second step is to make the energy balance by summing up all four energy amounts transferred to and out of the building. There are three cases. First, if the balance is zero, the system is balanced. There is as much energy flowing into the building as leaving the building, so no heating or cooling are needed. 
the desired indoor temperature is naturally achieved. In temperate cold countries, this would happen mainly in summer, while in warmer countries, this could happen in spring or autumn. Let's take the example of a building with indoor temperature 20 degrees Celsius and take a certain day in the year where the transmission energy is minus 1000 kilowatt hour. Ventilation and infiltration are minus 1125. Solar gains are 1204 and internal heat gains are 921 kilowatt hour. I remind you that in is positive and out is negative. So the energy in consists of the solar gains and internal heat gains and amounts 2125 kilowatt hour. The energy out consists of transmission and ventilation and infiltration and amounts minus 2125 kilowatt hour. This is therefore perfectly in balance and no heating or cooling is needed to maintain the building at 20 degrees. Second, if the balance is negative, this means that more energy leaves the building than it comes in. There is therefore a deficit in heat that can be compensated only by two ways. Don't forget that the law of energy conservation has to be satisfied. The first way is to accept a decrease of the indoor temperature, which will automatically reduce the energy losses. As an example, if in winter you accept a temperature of 7 degrees inside your house, while it is 5 outdoor, there are almost no heat losses to the outdoor. If you don't want this temperature decrease, you need to add energy to the system. That is, you need to add as much heat as needed to bring the balance to zero. That is what we call the energy demand for heating. Let's take again the example of the building with indoor temperature 20 degrees and take another day in the year where the transmission energy is minus 2000 kilowatt hour. Ventilation and infiltration are minus 1500. Solar gains are 500 and internal heat gains are 921 kilowatt hour. The energy in consists of the solar gains and internal heat gains and amounts 1421 kilowatt hour. The energy out consists of transmission and ventilation and infiltration and amounts minus 3500 kilowatt hour. If we make the sum of them, we see an unbalance of minus 2079 kilowatt hour that must be compensated by bringing an additional 2079 kilowatt hour heat in the building. The heating demand is 2079 kilowatt hour. If the balance is positive, this means that more energy comes in the building than it leaves. There is therefore a surplus of heat that can be compensated only by two ways again because of the law of energy conservation. The first way is to accept an increase of the indoor temperature, which will automatically increase, increase the energy losses. As an example, if in summer you accept a temperature of 40 degrees inside your house, while it is 30 outdoor, there will be much more heat losses to outdoor than if you want to maintain the indoor temperature at 30. If you don't want this temperature increase, you need to remove energy from the system. That is, you need to apply as much cooling as needed to bring the balance to zero. That is what we call the energy demand for cooling. Please be aware here that applying cooling means in fact removing energy. Let's take again the example of a building with indoor temperature 20 degrees and take a warm day in the year where the transmission energy is 800 kilowatt hour. Ventilation and infiltration are 850 Solar gains are 1204 and internal heat gains are 921 kilowatt hour. So the energy in consists of the solar gains, internal heat gains and also of the transmission and ventilation and infiltration as these are positive. It amounts therefore 3775 kilowatt hour. 
there is no energy out, and there is therefore an unbalance of 3775 uh, 3, kilowatt hour that must be compensated by removing this kilowatt hour's heat out of the building. We will say that the cooling demand is minus 3775 kilowatt hour. Sometimes people will say that the cooling de demand is plus 3775 kilowatt hour. But you know now that cooling is removing heat and should be counted negative. So when people say 3775 kilowatt hour, which we will also sometimes do during the course, they mean in fact minus 3775 kilowatt hour. In the former examples, we talked about energy amounts in kilowatt hour. In the next presentations, we will talk about energy flows in kilowatt. It may be a bit confusing to those without a background in thermodynamics. For the moment, don't bother about it and just accept that an energy balance is made in kilowatt hour, while the energy flows will be described first in kilowatt as energy rates, which is the quantity of energy flowing during a unit time. We will come back to this at the end of the week and in week three. Be also aware that we will always use SE units or units derived from them, so the temperatures will be in Kelvin or degrees Celsius. To summarize this lecture, you know now that the energy demand consists of space heating and cooling, hot tap water, cooking and electrical appliances. Of them, only space heating and cooling, lighting and to some extent pumping are building dependent. You also know that there are four energy transfer processes determining the energy balance, and these are transmission, ventilation and infiltration, solar gains and internal heat gains. You are now aware of the habit to count energy coming into a building as positive and energy flowing out of the building as negative. We have further discussed the law of conservation of energy that allows us to make energy balances and to use them to determine the demand for heating or cooling. If there is a negative unbalance, there is a heat deficit and therefore a heating demand of the same size as the unbalance, but with the opposite sign. If there is a positive unbalance, there is a heat surplus and therefore a cooling demand of the same size as the unbalance, but with the opposite sign too. Thank you for your attention.